Our goal is to understand how will or volition might work in the brain. In particular, we'd like to understand how the master volitional operator, namely volitional attention, works in the brain. If attention and volition are to have an effect within the brain, the neural code has to be one that allows for top-down influences that alter neural function. We'll learn soon that volitional attention is in part realized in the release of a special neurotransmitter called acetylcholine into the synapse, which alters neural function. But before we get there, we need to learn first about different types of neural responses or firing patterns. Our goal in this section is to learn about two patterns, synchronous firing and bursty firing. Now, if we were to anthropomorphize a neuron, which we really shouldn't do, but we will, we might say that a neuron's goal in life is to make those downstream neurons that receive its action potentials fire. Of course, neurons don't really have goals, but let's pretend that they do. Now, we also know that making a downstream neuron fire is not easy. One action potential is usually not enough to reach firing threshold. And a single EPSP tends to decay quickly back to the resting potential of the postsynaptic neuron. Depending on the temporal integration window of a neuron, EPSPs will only sum up to the firing threshold if numerous EPSPs arrive within some few tens of milliseconds of each other. For this reason, we should think of neurons as coincidence detectors. They tend to respond best when many action potentials coincide in the time of their arrival. In the absence of such coincidence or coincidence, they are not likely to fire above their own baseline firing rate. So neurons are sensitive not to the amount of energy impinging upon them. They're sensitive to the timing or temporal pattern of that energy. In a word, neurons are pattern detectors. They respond to a particular pattern of energy. That pattern is the temporal coincidence of action potential arrival. This is why neurons are coincidence detectors. It's also why neurons are pattern detectors. It's why information is realized in the brain in patterns of energy or the phase of energy rather than in old-fashioned Newtonian aspects of energy such as mass and momentum. Now we can ask, how do we get enough EPSPs to arrive all at once so that they add up to trigger an action potential? Since the integration constant of a pyramidal cell is on the order of a few tens of milliseconds, and for some neurons even shorter than this, there are two broad classes of solution to the problem of simultaneous or coincident arrival of depolarizing inputs. One class of solutions occurs when several neurons from the previous stage of neural processing send their respective action potentials to the same downstream pyramidal cell at the same time. It is as if neurons at the previous stage collaborate to make a downstream neuron fire. This class of solutions can be thought of as neural synchrony. By firing in synchrony, their outputs arrive on a downstream neuron at the same time, or close enough, leading the EPSPs in the downstream neuron to add up before they have time to decay back down to the baseline of the postsynaptic neuron's resting potential. This coincidence of arrival will increase the likelihood that an action potential will be generated by the postsynaptic neuron. Another class of solutions is for a very few or even a single neuron to fire extremely rapidly with action potentials only a few milliseconds apart. If it fires quickly enough, then again, EPSPs can sum up and drive the postsynaptic neuron above threshold, making it fire. When a neuron fires in a machine gun-like fashion every few milliseconds, this is called neural bursting. So another class of solutions to the problem of successfully driving a postsynaptic neuron to fire is for the presynaptic neuron to burst. This is also called phasic firing. It's not surprising that information processing in the brain takes advantage of both solutions to neural signaling, namely both neural synchrony and neural bursting. Neural synchrony can be thought of as a large population or large ensemble solution to getting the next neuron to fire because many neurons must collaborate in order to drive a downstream neuron to fire. And neural bursting can be thought of as a small population or small ensemble solution to getting the next neuron to fire in that, in principle, even a single neuron that is firing very rapidly can increase the probability of postsynaptic firing. A given pyramidal cell can typically either burst or not. It can fire in either a tonic way or a phasic way or some combination of both patterns. 
A tonic pattern of firing, slowed down a lot, of course, might have a temporal pattern that sounds something like this. Pop, 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 pop. Of course, neurons don't make noises when they fire. This is just my way of trying to communicate the pattern of tonic firing. In contrast, a phasic pattern of firing might have a temporal pattern that sounds something like this. The number of spikes or action potentials per second might be the same on average, but the pattern is very different. And this temporal pattern has big effects on downstream processing. To sum up then, neurons tend to fire in one of two basic modes. In tonic firing, such as typically occurs at the baseline firing rate, neurons fire irregularly in a way that obeys so-called Poisson statistics. This just means that the amount of variability in interspike intervals, that is the time between two adjacent action potentials, varies as a linear function of the mean firing rate. An analogy for you to understand this is a bullseye that you're throwing a dart at. If the dartboard is close, there will be a small spread around the center where the dart hits. But if the dartboard is farther away, there will be a larger spread. In this case, the variability in distance from the target increases the further the target is away. In tonic firing, the variability of interspike intervals increases the higher the average firing rate. The average rate of tonic firing per unit time can increase or decrease in an analog manner, even though action potentials are themselves digital in the sense that they occur in an all or nothing manner. In phasic firing, however, action potentials cluster in time in brief but rapid bursts of spikes. Bursts are preceded and followed by periods of relative quiescence. A burst occurs when two or more action potentials are generated within rapid succession, typically at greater than 100 hertz, with a preceding and subsequent silent period. Three to five spikes separated by five milliseconds is common. Here you can see an example of a tonic firing pattern. And here you can see an example of what happens when the neuron bursts. With these two modes of firing, the nervous system can use the same neurons for at least two modes of information transmission or functional control, although there are likely to be even more modes of information processing than just these two. Neurons typically have a baseline firing rate that is tonic. This allows neurons to deviate from baseline both in terms of an increase away from that baseline and in terms of a decrease away from that baseline. I like to think of the baseline firing rate of a neuron as sort of like the idling of a car, which in many cars makes the car go if it's in drive, even if you're not hitting the gas pedal. You need the car to idle so that you can have fast responsiveness to either excitation, namely hitting the gas, or to inhibition, namely hitting the brakes. So information can in principle be encoded in terms of decreases in firing rate and in terms of increases. And there can be increases in the firing rate that are tonic in pattern or phasic. Thus, these two patterns of neural firing are not mutually exclusive. A very common type of neural spike train in visual processing areas occurs in response to the onset and offset of a visual stimulus. At first, the neuron is just firing tonically at its baseline firing rate. But once the information about the onset of the visual stimulus arrives, there's an onset transient, which is a kind of burst pattern. This is followed by an elevated firing rate. And often, the end of a spike train is associated with a second burst of firing known as the offset transient, corresponding to when information about the offset of a visual stimulus arrives. Here's an example of such a spike train pattern associated with the onset and offset of a visual stimulus. It turns out that these onset and offset transients are important for the neural coding of consciousness. Here's an example of a stimulus known as metacontrast masking by my friend Stephen Macknick. When the flanker bars do not abut the central bar, you can see the central bar just fine, flickering on and off very quickly. However, when I bring the flankers in so that they abut the central bar, its visibility goes down so much that it almost seems to disappear. And when I bring the flankers away from the central bar again, then you can see it again clearly. Why does this happen? One idea is that the onset transient of the flankers exactly overlaps the offset transient of the central bar. Any downstream neuron getting input from the location of this edge of abutment between the central bar and the flanker will have to decide whether to associate this transient with the offset of the bar in the middle or the onset of the flanker.
if conscious events are in part encoded in terms of the presence of onset and offset transients, and if one or both of these is erased because of this ambiguity, then, at least in this case of metacontrast masking, the decision appears to be to erase the central bar from your consciousness.